from 9 to 11. Oh, they took it back after. They took it back. Within two days. Within two days. Within two days. He came back. He was going to ascend the same that he was to. Right, right. <laughs> okay, I don't think that's very advertising. We haven't known about that. Okay. No, no, you were not about that. It was a big news. That was in India. Was that time, yeah. Wow, okay. Well, good news, guys. Yeah. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, right, okay. Tax saving strategies. Uh, introduction of LISA. That is Lifetime Individual Savings Account. Uh, very, very good for uh, in what you call, uh, young people between the age of 18 and 40. So, if you put £4,000 in a year, the government will put £5,000 on top, making it uh, a kind of lucrative investment for you all. Now, now LISA is purely for, uh, as I said earlier, between 18 and 40 year old, and you can all start from next year. And this is again purely for uh, giving a chance to the young generation to get on the property ladder, right? Uh, if you you are not allowed to spend the money anything else other than buying a property. And the maximum value of the property you can buy is £450,000. If you don't buy any property, you can still keep on putting money into the ISA and the government will still keep on giving you the money up to the age of 50. After which, they will stop giving you, putting any money. So you can still put in the ISA, but the government will stop. And you can only withdraw that money when you are 65 plus, not before that. If you, if you withdraw before that, then the government has got the right to withdraw what they're actually put in or tax you on top. Now this LISA was actually, as I said, purely to get youngsters on the property ladder. Yeah? Uh, it's a good saving tool, uh, so you can still use it. Um, obviously the allowance on the ISA also has increased to 20,000 pounds. LISA actually sits on top you know, sorry, sits between the ISA. So if your allowance is twenty thousand pound on uh, and on ISA, the four thousand pound belongs to LISA. So if you're putting four thousand pound into LISA, then your allowance is now sixteen thousand pound of investing. So just to be careful on that kind of note, basically. And please note, you cannot have more than two cash ISA, more than one cash ISA. You have two cash ISAs, and the email everybody finds out that's subject to tax and interest. So. Okay, look, uh, I just did explain to you in relation to, um, uh, okay, startup companies, uh, sorry, a startup company or a pension plan, company pension plan. Now, a lot of people actually really don't understand this thing, but uh, claiming pension uh, as an expense in the company is, you can get a relief on that, and I'm sure Rajita uh, Vaya is sitting there, she basically knows all that, you know, and I'm sure you all are using her services to find out more of that. You know, I get clients and I said, and I said, why don't you put into pension? I said, actually, you know what? I'm not going to be staying in this country. Why do I need to put in pension? What am I going to get out of this pension thing? You know? I said, that's not the case. You know, like if you put money into your pension, the government actually puts 20% on top. So every hundred pounds, you get 20% on top. Plus, if you're running a limited company, then you get 20% tax relief. So it's a it's a win-win situation. So I don't know what is deterring you from putting any money into that. You know. So, I know the stock exchange goes up and down, but uh, if you ask Anjita, and she knows the figures, that uh, over the period, if you have a long-term investment, it does go up, doesn't it, Anjita? So, I would recommend that uh, to reduce your corporation tax, please, please put money into your pension. That is still a valid point. Um, right, now, okay, another target that government tried to put was uh, in relation to the thousand pound income that you earn. So all of you guys who are employed, right, and you have kind of a side business to giving consultancy services or whatever, if you make thousand pounds on those kind of services, you don't need to declare that to inland revenue. Okay, that also goes on for property landlords. If you and that's it's never going to be thousand pounds, it's going to be always more. But you know, like how stupid, you know, just put thousand pounds in. And you're going to make more than thousand pounds anyway. But first thousand pounds on your any on your what you call consultancy income, even if you're employed, or if you're, sorry, if you're employed, it's completely tax free. So uh, just to keep that in mind, you don't need to actually put that in your tax returns at all. Uh, business rates, I did explain to you in relation to that. Life insurance. Now, I'm sure all of you have life insurance. Is that correct? Yeah. I uh, B. Are you all 
contracting are you all uh, in your own businesses yeah no well if you are and uh, and if you are actually paying life insurance out of your business you are actually wasting money you know why not pay through your business so why not have life insurance through your business and that is known as relevant life insurance if you have a relevant life insurance, you can claim that as an expense in your business and claim 20% tax relief, right? So better do that because a lot of people are actually paying life insurance out of their businesses. So uh, that's one tax saving strategy. <coughs> right, uh, rent a room. I don't know if you guys are renting any part of your house as a room to rent a room to any of your uh, tenants. But uh, again, rent a room relief. The government really likes this kind of thing, you see. What they've done, A, they've increased the allowance from 4,250 to 7,500 per year. So anything above 7,500, you do not have to pay any tax on rent. So isn't that amazing? Plus, on a rent, a rental room relief or on any of the holiday lets, you can claim all sorts of expenses. Wear and tear, uh, interest relief on your, what do you call, uh, Mortgages, everything. You can claim all that kind of expenses. So that is still valid, but uh, not on your private and residential properties. So something that uh, if you have a room to rent out, please do. You can make some money out of it. Yeah, rather than it remaining empty. Especially if your children are all going to university, then it's you and your wife actually living in the house. Why not make some money? Um, well, now married couples. As joint directors and shareholders can earn £32,000. Now, as I always say, as contractors, we still can make hay while the sun shines. Yeah? So if you're a contractor, both you and your partner can be shareholders in the company and can get £86,000 out by only paying 4015 tax this year. Amazing, isn't it? And we could to pay the 20% corporation tax, but overall, you will still make money. So you are actually making £32,000 tax-free. That's £11,000 each as your personal allowance. Yeah. Plus £10,000 on your dividend income. Yeah. So you are still making tax-free allowance. So please utilize this facility till still it is available. I'm not sure if the public sector thing goes good, then by 2018-19 that can be abolished and things can go the other way around. Now the government is trying very, very hard in order to put uh, what do you call uh, all the employed, uh, self-employed people in line with the employed people. And what they're trying to say is that uh, uh, well, there was a big discussion saying that uh, hold on a minute, the self-employed takes so much risk, and uh, whereas the employed don't take that risk. So where is the benefit of being self-employed? Uh, but the government says that well, that's the choice you made to be a self-employed person. So. Uh, you have to pay those kind of taxes. So the, the, the dividend tax, which is the 7.5% which has come in, is purely to deter the national insurance which we self-employed people are not paying. So just to be aware of that, that they're trying to do that. So I'm sure you all know about the dividend tax rules going forward. 5,000 pound allowance. Yeah, it's not a tax-free income. It's an allowance, right? So, if you are aware of your band, tax band, the first 20% tax band, which is 0 to 32,000 pound, I don't know if you're all aware of that, and you get 20% tax on 0 to 32,000 pound after 11,000 pound, that 5,000 pound sits between the 0 to 32,000 pound. Okay? So, 32,000 pound minus a 5,000 pound allowance gives you 27,000 pound. So, that 27,000 pound is subject to 7.5% dividend tax. Okay? Anything more than that you pay will be subject to 32.5% up to 100,000 pounds, right? And then it goes on to 38.1. So just to be aware that uh, how this is going to be played out. Um, yeah, you still have that kind of thing in relation to putting your wife in there and making some money out of it, but uh, that's about it. So is it useful only for actually contractors who are kind of running their own limited company? No, 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 it's actually used for anybody, actually. Uh, <coughs> it's used for uh, large companies like yours, you know, if you're having more directors, then you can get your first five dollars from allowance anyway. And the remaining you can take that as... But uh, there is a tax strategy that you can play around with. Sorry, this yeah. one, one, one. 
scenario that, sure. that I have. I, I'm contacting her and have my money and everything. Uh, my wife works and she's employed, pays the tax for her and that and everything. Does that apply for her then? You mean married the couple subject to the tax? Yeah, it does she, apply. Yeah. So if she if she earns out of my company hmm. and when I file a self uh, self assessment. <coughs> Is it kind of separated out, out of our tax lab? Yeah. So what you could do basically is that uh, if, you, if you include your wife in your company, right, I would suggest that you split the shares between A and B shares, right? Because if you have A shares, then you'd like to split your income equally according, according to the shareholding. So it's 50 50, will be 50 50. And because she already earns outside, and if she takes 50% income from you, she'll be heavily taxed. So if you have a split shareholding between A and B, then if she is B shareholder, then I would say just give her five thousand pound, so that the five thousand pound is then tax free allowance. You know, if she is earning thirty, if she's earning up to thirty thousand pound, then I'll say why don't you top it up by another twelve thousand pound, right? So five thousand is tax free, right? The remaining can be up to seven point five percent. You can still take money out of the company. How frequently should we be changing the, <coughs> uh, the ratio? Usually, if you see the employer contractor, will have 51%, yeah. and he'll keep his wife on 49%, mm. just to measure up the lowest tax bracket they could fall in. Right. How frequently we should be changing, like for example, if your wife's earning is going high, you would want to reduce the percentage from 49 to 45. Yeah. How frequently we should be doing it? Once well, you, you are not supposed to do it frequently, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the HMRC doesn't like it, actually. You know yeah, that. I know that. First of all, they don't like the wife being in the company as a... <laughs> that's why I have to yeah, yeah. A lot of people here don't know more yeah. how frequently you should be changing. Well, you can't frequently change it because, obviously, if you keep on changing it, then you are changing the dividend allowance or dividend payments and all that kind of stuff. That can be bought up, you know. Usually, people don't... You know, they doesn't find out. But if they do, then they'll say, hold on a minute, you are actually... Uh, how do you say, doing a better breakfast over here, so. And frankly speaking, you can't just change, right? Yeah. It has to be a buy and sell of shares. Yeah. The buy and sell of shares is a process as well, really. It's going to yeah. cost you money as well. So it's not something. You fill in the J10 form and all that kind yeah. of stuff, so it's kind of a tedious thing. So, usually I think our advice is that if your wife is earning elsewhere and uh, you are also the director and shareholder of the company, it's better to split your shares. So, if you don't want to give the B shareholder any, any dividends, you can actually avoid from doing so. And what you can do is that obviously, I don't think it's any, among you people, but among the other, other, other white community, they don't want to give more access to their wives, or they don't want to give more, what you call, power to their wives. So the B shareholders can be kind of a, how do you say, have no voting rights, have no rights to actually challenge the customer, <coughs> do this in the company or do that in the company. You can, you can say, oh, hold on, when you're a B shareholder, you don't have any rights to tell me anything. So, I'm giving you a dividend, that's about it. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's all of my tax saving strategies, but if you have any questions, uh, please, please feel free to ask. Uh, we'll start with that. Uh